Margaret. Thank you very much, Jen. So, uh, I'd like to thank the um, American Philosophical Society for this opportunity and the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, it's a great pleasure. So I'd like to talk about um, what we're doing in the field of biology and, and how, this, how there's a, a very big revolution happening in this field. And uh, thank you, Roberta, for that fabulous introduction. Um, we do live in a microbial world. So what we're seeing is a, a huge sea change uh, in the field of biology. <clears throat> and how, what is happening is we have a much, uh, it's being driven by a better understanding of the diversity of, of, the, of the life, uh, the biosphere. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you about the basis of this revolution and why it is so very critical. I like to make this uh, analogy um, and that is that um, back in the, the uh, 1600s, 15 and 1600s, there was a revolution in astronomy. And uh, Copernicus had an idea, but it didn't have legs until there was a new lens, until there was a technological innovation, and that was Galileo's telescope. And with that, we went from a geocentric world to a heliocentric world, and our concept changed. And so what happened here was this invention, this new lens, uh, changed our view of the universe and our view of our position in the universe. And this was huge. And um, I just read in the newspaper a few days ago that in 1992, Pope Pius um, um, exonerated uh, Galileo. <laughs> so, so what about biology? Okay, what is the new lens for biology? Um, for over 2,000 years, uh, we organized the biosphere optically based on what we could see either with the unaided or the aided eye. And that starts with Aristotle. He recognized plants and animals. Then Anton van Leeuwenhoek in the 16 and 1700s um, had a small microscope and he did a cheek swab. And he put that cheek swab on his little microscope, and he saw what he called animicules, very small things. So it was divided into these three groups. Then um, Robert Whitaker, um, in, in the sort of 1960s, began to use the electron microscope to look at, at cells of organisms, and he divided the organisms into the eukaryotic group and the prokaryotic group. The eukaryotic group was animals, plants, and fungi, and, and unicellular things that had a nucleus. The bacteria had no nucleus. They were the most simple things. And it was thought at this time that bacteria, there were 7,000 species of bacteria, which is the number of species of snakes. So just to give you an idea of how, <clears throat> excuse me, how little we thought of bacteria. So this five kingdom model, I would imagine the biologists in this room, many of the biologists in this room, would have learned the five kingdom model. And so, um, this continues to be taught, unfortunately, because it's <laughs> incorrect. But um, you can see that we uh, saw the world based on optics. Then along came this guy named Carl Woese. Carl Woese is at the University of Illinois, and um, he actually was a physical chemist there. And his idea, um, which he began to explore in the uh, late 1970s, was we shouldn't be looking at what we can see and how we can, how we, can, we shouldn't bin things on, on what they look like, but rather on their genes, which is what really tells the relatedness of organisms. And so he, he, he used genetic sequences rather than optics to determine relatedness of life forms on Earth. So then the, the problem was sequencing was really slow and really expensive until the turn of the century. <laughs> And what happened was, around 2006, there was a big breakthrough, a new lens. And that new lens was something called next-gen sequencing, next-generation sequencing. And everything became fast and cheap. And so what happened was, you went, we went in around 2001 from around $6,000 a megabase of sequencing, that's how much it cost, about $6,000, to a few cents incredibly democratizing. It everybody started going out and sequencing. Ecologists were sequencing 
you know, it, it was just this huge, huge, huge uh, breakthrough, a new lens. And this new lens is reshaping biology. And mind you guys, this has only been 15 years since this has happened. So what have we learned? Well, what we've learned thus far is um, taking um, Robert Whitaker's Five Kingdom model, what happens to this group with all the sequence space that has now been analyzed? This is what happened. <laughs> the eukaryota are now known, there are thought to be two domains, bacteria and archaea, and the eukarya are thought to be a, a branch of one of what had been this guy. So this guy expanded into this. And we now know that the diversity of life is overwhelmingly microbial. Okay, this is huge, huge change in the way we think. So the activities of microbes drive the form and function of the biosphere. We now are learning, there's no question, and are pivotal in shaping the health of all life. And the impact, what, what's so fun for somebody as senior as myself, is to watch how this is, biology is being reshaped um, by this, this find, these findings in the last 15 years. It's actually huge. So I just wanted to give you guys an example. Now there's something called PubMed, and it's a search engine that biologists use. What they do is they go to PubMed and they type in what they want to know about, and you, you get an idea of how much work is being done in that particular thing. So what I did was I went in um, to this um, search engine in PubMed, and I typed in the word microbiome, which is the word that we're talking about here, what we're talking about here, and the following words, soil, plant, ecology, and brain, you know, really diverse areas of biology. Just to get an idea of how those, those areas have changed in, in the publications, in you know, how much research is being done there. Look at the trajectories of these fields. I mean, this is truly amazing. So you see, see that in soil, um, actually that, that arrow is at the 2006 mark. You can see that, you know, this exponential growth in, in all of these fields, microbiome and, and it's, it's just truly phenomenal what's happening. We're learning so much, as Roberta mentioned, we're just learning so much about how the world actually works. <laughs> so it's, it's a fun time. So one of the things that we've learned is that symbiosis runs large portions of the biosphere. And so what I'm showing here is I'm showing a coral reef, uh, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. They're dominant features that actually shape the oceans um, in those regions. Up here in the upper right is the, um, the, a dry rift valley in the Antarctic. The only thing that lives there is a symbiotic system, and that is lichens. Only lichens live there, which are a combination of a series of microorganisms. On, down in the lower left, I'm showing um, a montane forest. And we would not have had the water to land transition in plants. There would be no plants on Earth if we did not have microbial fungi in the soil that enabled the water to land transition in plants. So all the plants that you see out there, actually some of them have figured out ways to lose those, those fungi and not have to depend upon them. But 80 to 90% of all plants rely on fungi in the soil. And of course over here on the lower right, is a kid and his cat. <laughs> and those, those rely for their health on, um, on the, mi the microbial world. Now this guy in the lower right-hand corner um, is a human being, and humans are incredibly complex. They just have incredibly complex um, microbiomes. And as Roberta mentioned at the beginning, they're, they're 10 to the 13th to 10 to the 14th cells in our microbiome, and there are 10 to the 13th body cells in the human. So we're half to 90% um, uh, microbial. Hundreds to thousands of species. Now this is really complicated. And what, micro, uh, what biologists do when they face something really complicated is they look for simple model systems to try to provide insight into how something so complex can work. So um, um, in the field, 
of, of symbiosis research, there have been models that are being developed, and I'm showing some of them here. The idea is that, um, come on, microbes have been around forever, and so it's very likely that, that um, what the communication between microbes and animals, plants, and fungi is very, very old and highly evolutionarily conserved. And so these models should be able to provide insight uh, into what, you know, what's going on. I work on this little bobtail squid in the upper right, uh, the Hawaiian bobtail squid, and I've been doing that for over 30 years, uh, and it's, it's just the most fun. We've learned a lot, um, but I wanted to introduce you to this animal. And so um, what you see here is you see, can we turn the lights down? Is that possible? No? Okay, what you see here is these guys are night active predators. And so they bury in the sand during the day, and they're in, over in the Hawaiian archipelago in the shallow water. They bury in the sand during the day, and there he's buried, he's finishing. <laughs> and, and they come out at night and forage in the water column. And so this guy forages in the water column, and what is he doing? He's using light of a symbiotic luminous bacterium um, and he has an organ inside of his body, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and he shines light down. And in other words, he, has, he mimics moonlight and starlight in, with that so that a visual field of a predator looking up from below, can't, he, can't, the predator can't see uh, Euprimna. So it's, it's a really good camouflaging mechanism. And in the field, you never see an animal without... Um, uh, luminous bacteria in its light organ. And so it's a very effective anti-predatory strategy. So um, how do we study this? Well, um, if you take this guy and you open him up, you see it's got a really complex bilobed light organ um, in the center of the mantle cavity, and it's got this luminous bacteria. The luminous bacteria are culturable in the lab. You can ma genetically manipulate them. And um, we're at this, at this time, we're developing genetic manipulation uh, in the squid as well. So it's really um, a, a fun time in working with this. Now, why do we like this guy so much? Here's why we like this guy. How many of you have seen My Dinner with Andre? OK, it, this movie. There's not a lot of action in this movie. <laughs> but it's fascinating, because these two guys go to dinner together, and they start talking. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but I thought this guy was nuts at the beginning, and this guy was sane. And at the end of the movie, I thought this guy was sane, and this guy was nuts. In other words, you sat there, and you were able to understand the motivations, the interactions, and so on, between these two became very clear. You know, you could, you could sit there and watch their dialogue and understand their motivations. And so the squid vibrio system, as a binary system, allows us to listen in on the dialogue between a microbe and, and its host organism. And I make the, the, the gut is like the kum, beautiful Kumbh Mela celebration in India where 110 million Hindus get together. I mean, you're never going to understand <laughs> what's going on and the relationships among that. It's very, very hard. So our goal is to provide insight and to tell the biomedical community to look there. Look there. So, um, and just to show you guys that, that it is highly conserved, the epithelial um, form and function of the epithelia is highly conserved. So these microbes that we study um, interface with mucociliary membranes, like in your trachea, and, the, and microvilla structures, like in your gut. And in fact, if you had a microscope, and you put these two under a microscope, and you asked a biologist to tell you where that animal came from, they wouldn't be able to. But because there's this, it's so very similar um, across the animal kingdom are these mucociliary and microvillous structures. So we, we ask the questions uh, about these surfaces. The questions we ask, how in the world do you establish a symbiosis? Humans are born sterile, um, and they begin to acquire their, their microbiota going through the birth canal, and, and breastfeeding is also really important in you know, picking things up from the environment. Um, how do they know their partners? They don't select a random sample of the environment out there. They know 
Um, there's, there's, you know, co-evolution co of the human microbiome. So there's the establishment. How does that squid, against the background of a million other bacteria in the seawater, know that bacterium? How does it do that? And so establishment development, they co-develop. Um, you know, the, the gut in your, in, the bacteria in your gut help the maturation of the gut tissue and stability. Once they're in there, how do you make sure the immune system doesn't get rid of them, nor do they overgrow the host? So this is really important. So I just want to give you one example of where the squid vibrio system has provided some evidence of, of or given the biomedical community something to think about. Um, and that's instability. It turns out that the system is on a profound circadian rhythm. The population of the bacteria are on this profound rhythm. And you can see each day the population changes quite a bit. And so it was really interesting. It turned out in investigating this deeply that the bacteria actually drive those rhythms. Without the bacteria, you don't... And, and if the bacteria are dark, you know, the, the light is there, what they're doing for the animal. If the bacteria are dark, the rhythm doesn't happen. So in, we, did that, we did this stuff... In, in 2013, okay, excuse me, 2010. And I kept going to the um, human microbiome meetings and saying, you guys have to look at circadian rhythm. The, we know the gut's on a circadian rhythm. Are the microbes involved? And so I, <laughs> somebody finally listened, and um, they began to look at this, and it's really exciting. There's been a huge, we know now that the circadian, human circadian rhythms um, are, are locked into the circadian rhythms of the microbiome. Now, um, as of um, since 2013, we have a lot of references, and three hundred, most of them are in the last three years. So this is a really booming area. So why is all of what I've told you, why do I feel it's so important? Why do I feel that we begin to understand the natural world as a microbial world that we live in? And why is this concept so important at this time? Because we have a very big climate crisis. And in my opinion, um, we need to push this revolution forward, and it's critical. Because if we don't, we cannot possibly have effective and creative solutions to climate change if we don't have an accurate concept of the structure and function of the biological world. We have to incorporate this into our thinking. And um, I want to give a shout out for after the break. Um, Victoria Orphan is going to be talking to us about the oceans. And just this last week, there was this great paper out talking about how the oceans uh, and the microbes of the oceans are actually what is running the biosphere. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, this is my group, the Squid Vibrio System on the 30th anniversary down at Scripps Oceanography, um, and all of the funding agencies that have given me funding over these last years. Thank you. That was great. Questions? Comments? Well, I'll start with one. Um, so, uh, this circadian rhythm issue is, yeah. is fantastic. Yeah. So, what happens when you take antibiotics and you wipe yourself out? Yeah, so, so there are a couple of observations. One is that um, germ-free mice have, are a wreck with regard to day-night cycles. And when you take antibiotics, you can disturb your, your sleep cycles. People have probably, you guys have probably noticed that. Also, when you travel, that's why you're supposed to eat when, at the, at, when those people are eating, wherever you're going, um, because you're setting your, your microbiome. You're resetting your microbiome to, to, to be uh, cued at a different time. Yeah. Questions? Annie? It... Um, there's oh, the there's balcony. some up. There's one on the balcony. A couple on the balcony. Yes. Uh, hi. Oh, okay. Hi. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm uh, Le Leslie Aiello from Brooklyn, New York. And we, we know that there's been very um, 
uh, significant climate change in prehistory, going way back. And is there any way from the microbial uh, to sort of study this, to see how the microbes have changed, say, you know, 500,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago as the Earth has gone through these previous major climate changes? You know, Leslie, I am not a microbiologist. I studied the host, but I'm going to ask Diane. Diane, would you be willing to answer that question? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or just from there. You've got the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, Diane is a, a geomicrobiologist, so. Um, that's... That's a very insightful question, and we can gain some perspective on it by looking at molecular fossils that we can extract from ancient rocks. And there are particular types of molecules whose biological function is quite well known to correlate with certain types of stresses, for instance, with extreme heat. And so you can, in this way, begin to connect the dots between the appearance of these biomolecules in very ancient sedimentary rocks and past climatic events, for example. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Diane. We'll take one last question. I think there was one. Was there one in the back up, up top? Well, if not. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Margaret. <laughs>